that Cornwallis' soldiers promised to retaliate against the homes and persons of any Virginians who bore arms against the king. The property of those who figured prominently in the rebellion suffered thorough destruction. This was how Thomas Jefferson, then Virginia's governor, described what Cornwallis did to his estate at Elk Hill. He destroyed all my growing crops of corn and tobacco. He burned all my barns containing the same articles of the last year, having first taken what corn he wanted. He used all my stocks of cattle, sheep, and hogs for the sustenance of his army, and carried off all the horses capable of service. Of those too young for service, he cut the throats and he burnt all the fences on the plantation so as to leave it an absolute waste. This family has not yet lost any tobacco slaves or other property by the enemy, George Mason reassured his son on June 3, 1781, but we are in daily expectation of sharing the same fate with our neighbors upon this and the other rivers, where many families have been suddenly reduced from opulence to indigence, particularly upon James River. The enemy taking all the slaves, horses, cattle, furniture, and other property they can lay their hands. While threatening Virginia rebels with instant impoverishment, Cornwallis kept the Americans from wearing down his troops with guerrilla warfare by making his army more mobile than Patriot forces. The Earl's command was well suited for a war swift maneuver. According to Sir Henry Clinton, the chief part of the royal troops in Virginia comprised, quote, the elite of my army, end quote. Most of Cornwallis's British regiments um, had been campaigning in North America since 1775 and 1776, and they included such renowned formations as the Brigade of Foot Guards, the 23rd Royal West Fusiliers, the 33rd Foot, Cornwallis's own regiment, and the 71st Fraser's Highlanders. Long hours of drill and frequent combat experience left these regulars equally adept at the formal European tactics of the day and also the open order wood woodland skirmishing favored by American irregulars. Among the most valuable units serving with Cornwallis were two green-coated Loyalist Corps, the British Legion and the Queen's Rangers. The British Legion was something of a miniature army. Half of its members were cavalry and the other half infantry. The Legion followed a ruthless young Englishman named Bannister Tarleton. This hard-riding light dragoon reportedly indulged a taste for cruelty. Rebels claimed that Tarleton ordered his men to murder prisoners, and the Legion also possessed an unenviable reputation for looting. Like the British Legion, the Queen's Rangers was a composite organization. Close to 40% of the men were horse soldiers, hussars and light dragoons, while the rest were superbly conditioned light infantry. The leader of the Queen's Rangers was another alert and active uh, young officer from England, John Graves Simcoe. A master of partisan warfare, Simcoe delighted in luring his adversaries into cleverly laid ambushes. Nevertheless, he seems to have been cut from a different cloth than the impetuous Tarleton. Simcoe fought hard, but he had no stomach for atrocities. He effectively prevented the Queen's Rangers from molesting helpless prisoners and non-competence. By combining the mounted detachments uh, from the British Legion and the Queen's Rangers, Cornwallis could count on the services of roughly 500 hussars and light dragoons. That was the largest number of horsemen ever assembled by the British during the war in the South. The size of the Earl's cavalry had a particularly intimidating effect on the Virginia militia. Recognizing the enemy's superiority in mounted troops gave Cornwallis a pronounced advantage. The Marquis de Lafayette, a young French general commanding the Continental Forces charged with defending Virginia, complained in a letter to George Washington, and don't worry, I know my French accent so bad I'm not even going to try to attempt one, but Lafayette wrote, was I to fight a battle, I'll be cut to pieces. The militia dispersed and the arms lost. Was I to decline fighting, the country would think herself given up. I am therefore determined to skirmish, he spelled skirmish with, a, with an A, but not to engage too far, and particularly to take care against their immense and excellent body of horse, meaning cavalry, whom the militia fears like they would so many beasts. Even as Lafayette wrote these words, however, Cornwallis took steps that prevented the rebels from impeding the progress of British forces in Virginia. Since the late 17th century, the favorite hobbies of Virginia's gentry were breeding and racing fine horses. There was hardly a plantation on, in the Old Dominion that did not boast of a well-stocked stable full of thoroughbreds. 
When Cornwallis invaded Virginia, he seized these spirited chargers for his own use. Thanks to this inexhaustible supply of remounts, the Earl's 500 light dragoons and hussars could travel 30 to 70 miles a day which greatly increased the range and unsettling impact of their raids. Cornwallis also put seven to 800 of his infantrymen on horseback, thus more than doubling his mounted strength. On June 4, 1781, a worried Richard Henry Lee told his brother, the fine horses on the James River have furnished them with a numerous and powerful cavalry. For the first time in the American Revolution, a British army could outrun its rebel opponents. Lafayette had only 4,500 frightened troops, many of them untrained, to counter Cornwallis' movements. That figure included no more than 300 cavalry. To avoid, to avoid encirclement or, or, uh, or surprise by the Earl's larger and faster army, Lafayette felt compelled to keep at least 20 miles away from the British. At that distance, he could neither oppose nor harass the Redcoats. The British have so many dragoons, Lafayette curtly informed Governor Jefferson, that it becomes impossible to stop or reconnoiter their movements. All through the spring and summer of 1781, Cornwallis found himself free to go where he wanted. Since Lafayette stayed out of harm's way, the Earl kept his army intact and potent. He did not have to fight any bloody battles to advance his strategy. The ravaging of the Old Dominion proceeded unchecked. The fact is, Richard Henry Lee related, the enemy, by a quick collection of their force and by rapid movements, are now in the center of Virginia, with an army of regular infantry greater than that of the compounded regulars and militia commanded by the Marquis de Lafayette, and with five or six hundred excellent cavalry. This country is, in the moment of its greatest danger, abandoned to the arts and arms of the enemy. It's one unhappy taxpayer. Although Cornwallis sought to subdue Virginia by striking at its civilian population, he did not allow his army to degenerate into a mob of freebooters. His war on private property proceeded under strict supervision. From Cole's plantation, the Earl admonished his army on June 5, 1781, all private foraging is again forbid, and the outposts are not to suffer any foraging party to pass without a commissioned officer. Six days earlier, the commander of the 43rd Regiment of Foot announced, any soldier absent from camp without leave and writing from the officer commanding his company will be punished as a marauder. Those redcoats and loyalists who defied the Earl's efforts to maintain discipline and order risked swift and merciless punishment. On June 2nd, Lieutenant Colonel Simcoe informed Cornwallis that two light dragoon privates from the Queen's Rangers had raped and robbed a woman named Jane Dickinson. After an inquiry established the two loyalists' guilt, the Earl directed that they be executed the following day. Cornwallis not only strove to prevent his new strategy from reaching inhumane extremes, but he also made guarded use of conciliatory gestures. On August 14th, he instructed one of his subordinates, all militiamen prisoners of war taken before the 18th of June are to be released on parole unless some particular crime is alleged against them. Such magnanimity was lost on many of the Earl's enemies, who were more impressed by the destructive impact that his army had on the areas it traversed. Cornwallis' campaign and Tilton's patrols ravaged the countryside and destroyed the fields of maize to an extent where even inhabitants had scarcely enough for their subsistence, reported a French officer. There is no hay at all in Virginia. After the British briefly occupied Williamsburg, a disconsolate major in the state militia wrote his wife, here they remained for some days, and with them pestilence and famine took root, and poverty brought up the rear. As the British plundered all they could, you will conceive how great an appearance of wretchedness this place must exhibit. Fortunately, they've cleaned up Williamsburg since then. As far as the white citizens of Virginia were concerned, though, the most unnerving thing Cornwallis did was to liberate their black slaves. Virginia's 200,000 bondsmen made up 40% of the state's population. Had Cornwallis been permitted to follow his own instincts, those exploited masses might have tipped the balance in favor of his attempted conquest of the Old Dominion. In this politically correct era, most American history textbooks are sure to mention those African Americans who supported the Patriot cause, as well they should. But as Ellen Gibson Wilson has pointed out, there has been some reluctance to face the implication of the fact that the overwhelming majority of blacks who acted from choice were pro-British. The story David Waldstriker, my colleague at Temple University, put it more objectively when he said, one of the less well-known facts about the Revolutionary War is that African Americans fought on both 
both sides, primarily with their own freedom in mind. Statistics reveal that many African Americans harbored no loyalty to a movement that promised life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness solely to white adult males. Of the 500,000 blacks who inhabited the 13 colonies during the War of Independence, as many as 80 to 100,000 flocked to the king's forces. The reason was simple, but compelling. As Reverend Henry Muhlenberg, a Lutheran minister who worked near Philadelphia, confided to his diary, blacks, quote, secretly wished that the British army might win, for then all Negro slaves will gain their freedom, end quote. It is said, Muhlenberg later observed, that this sentiment is almost universal among the Negroes in America. The British did offer freedom of sorts to slaves who reached royal lines, provided the fugitives' owners were rebels. That qualification was forgotten, however, as the news worked its way through the slave grapevine. Most blacks came to equate the sight of a soldier in a red coat with liberty. The British did not begin to suspect how far and wide this misconception had spread until they invaded the South, where the overwhelming number of slaves resided. Dwelling upon his experiences in South Carolina, Colonel Tarleton reported that all the Negroes, men, women, and children, upon the approach of any detachment of the King's troops, thought themselves absolved from all respect to their American masters and entirely released from servitude. Influenced by this idea, they quitted the plantations and followed the army. As long as the British sought to win the allegiance of white Americans, they discouraged this black exodus. A few weeks before Sir Henry Clinton sailed from Charleston to New York, he instructed Cornwallis, as to the Negroes, I will leave such orders as I hope will prevent the confusion that would arise from a further desertion of them to us. And I will consider some scheme of placing those we have on abandoned plantations on which they may, may subsist. In the meantime, your lordship can make such arrangements as will discourage their joining us. The Redcoats even returned runaways to masters who were reputedly loyal or even neutral. By the time Cornwallis entered Virginia, however, he no longer worried about the feelings of colonial slave owners, and he permitted black runaways to tag along with his soldiers. The response of Virginia's blacks astounded both the patriots and the British. The damage sustained by individuals on this occasion is inconceivable, testified Dr. Robert Hunneman, a physician in Hanover County, especially in Negroes. The infatuation of these poor creatures was amazing. They flocked to the enemy from all quarters, even from the very remote parts. Many gentlemen lost 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70 Negroes besides their stocks of cattle, sheep, and horses. Some plantations were entirely cleared, and not a single Negro remained. Several endeavored to bring their Negroes up the country, and some succeeded. But from others, the slaves went off by the way and went to the enemy. Your neighbors, Colonel Tolliver and Colonel Travis, lost every slave they had in the world, Richard Henry Lee informed his brother William, and Mr. Paradise has lost all his but one. This has been the general case of those who were near the enemy. Other prominent Virginians told similar stories. For instance, Thomas Nelson, the militia general who succeeded Thomas Jefferson as governor midway through Cornwallis' campaign. Nelson owned 700 slaves before the British entered Virginia. After Yorktown, no more than 80 to 100 remained under his control. Cornwallis' soldiers actively encouraged Virginia slaves to follow them. Dr. Hunneman, who refused to flee his home at the Earl's approach, observed the enemy's recruitment practices. Wherever they had an opportunity, Hunneman confided to his journal, the soldiers and inferior officers entossed and flattered the Negroes and prevailed on vast numbers to go along with them, but did not compel any. Captain Johann Ewald, the commander of a crack Hessian Jaeger detachment with Cornwallis, explained his comrade's sudden passion for liberating slaves. These people were given their freedom by the army because it was actually thought this would punish the rich, rebellious-minded inhabitants of Virginia. Richard Henry Lee charged that force, fraud, intrigue, theft have all in turn been employed to delude these unhappy people, meaning the slaves, and to fraud their masters. Despite such anguished assertions, however, there is abundant evidence that those slaves who joined the British did so freely. By the middle of June 1781, at least 12,000 runaway slaves were with Cornwallis' army. Thomas Jefferson later claimed, from an estimate I made at the time on the best information I could collect, I suppose the state of Virginia lost under Lord Cornwallis' hand that year about 30,000 slaves. How all this appeared to the British is revealed by the diary of Captain Yield. Yield wrote, 
Every officer had four to six horses and three or four Negroes, as well as one or two Negresses for cook and maid. Every soldier's woman was mounted and also had a Negro and Negress on horseback for his servants. Each squad had one or two horses and Negroes, and every non-commissioned officer had two horses and one Negro. Yes, indeed, I can testify that every soldier had his Negro who carried his provisions and bundles. This multitude always hunted at a gallop, and behind the baggage followed well over 4,000 more Negroes of both sexes and all ages. Any place this horde approached was eaten clean, like an acre invaded by a swarm of locusts. Virginia's fugitive slaves did more than serve the Earl's soldiers as porters and body servants. The blacks also contributed, contributed substantially to Cornwallis's new style of warfare. By encouraging the slaves to leave their masters, Cornwallis threatened Virginia with complete economic ruin. Slaves represented the currency whereby the Tidewater planters calculated their wealth. Slaves also provided the cheap labor undergirding the old dominion's agrarian prosperity. Thus Cornwallis robbed Virginia of the very means of production required to replace the vital resources his troops were destroying. The addition of thousands of African Americans to the British forces greatly augmented Cornwallis' ability, ability to ravage the countryside. Dr. Hunterman of Hanover County left this vivid picture of one of Cornwallis' abandoned campsites. The day after the enemy left Mrs. Nicholas's plantation, I went over to her house where I saw the devastation caused by the enemies encamping there, for they encamped in her plantation and all around the house. The fences were pulled down and much of them burnt, many cattle, hogs, sheep, and poultry of all sorts killed, 150 bales of corn eat up or wasted, and the offal of the cattle, etc., with dead horses and pieces of flesh all in a putrefying state scattered over the plantation. Virginia's fugitive slaves also served Cornwallis in a more deliberate fashion. Runaways sometimes acted as spies and guides for the British. The blacks frequently showed their new friends where fleeing masters had hidden their valuables and livestock. In fact, the African Americans delivered so many horses to Cornwallis that Lafayette exclaimed, nothing but a treaty of alliance with the Negroes can find out dragoon horses, and it is by those means that the enemy have got a formidable cavalry. At other times, the blacks provided manual labor for the British Army. A corps of Negro pioneers, or military laborers, originally formed by General Phillips, buried the offal from butchered cattle uh, after Cornwallis' troops received issues of fresh meat, thus eliminating a nauseating stench and also a health hazard. The black pioneers and officers' servants pulled double duty as stevedores whenever Cornwallis used ships to transport soldiers' equipment and supplies. The extensive earthworks that Cornwallis had erected first at Portsmouth and then at Yorktown were built largely by black muscle. Finally, the defection of so many slaves spread the fear of servile revolt, the white South's most dreaded nightmare throughout Virginia. As much as Cornwallis benefited from the specter of black rebellion, he did not intend to unleash a racial reign of terror against the Old Dominion's white population. The Earl composed numerous regulations throughout his Virginia campaign aimed at ensuring orderly conduct among the slaves seeking his protection. To restore his army's proper military appearance and free his columns of unnecessary encumbrances, Cornwallis attempted to restrict the number of horses and blacks employed by his officers. A colonel, lieutenant colonel, or major of infantry was entitled to, quote, five horses and two Negroes, end quote. A captain could have three horses and one black servant. A regimental staff officer was allowed two horses and one black. A subaltern could have a pair of mounts and a single servant. And a surgeon was limited to one horse and one black. Sergeants Major, the most senior non-commissioned officers in the Earl's regiments, were also permitted one horse and one black servant apiece. Except for those detailed for mounted service, enlisted infantrymen did not receive permission to ride horses, and no one below the rank of Sergeant Major could enjoy the services of black servants. Cornwallis also stipulated no woman, meaning a white camp follower, or Negro to possess a horse, nor any Negro to be suffered to ride on a march, except such as belong to public departments. To distinguish the African Americans who were authorized to accompany the Army's different units from those who were not, Cornwallis decreed on May 21, 1781, the number and names of corps to be marked in a conspicuous manner on the jacket of each Negro. A week later, the Earl informed his army, all Negroes who are not marked agreeable to the orders repeated at Petersburg will be taken up and sent away from the Army. 
Cornwallis' headquarters frequently reminded unit commanders to purge their ranks of surplus horses and blacks. Typical of such orders was this one issued on June 5th. Lord Cornwallis desires the commanding officers of corps to examine strictly what number of Negroes uh, there are with their respective corps and see that no more are kept than those allowed by the regulation, and they will order all the able-bodied Negroes which they find above their number allowed to officers to be taken up and sent to Captain Brown of the Pioneers. Some of Cornwallis's officers, sharing his sense of military decorum, conscientiously enforced their commander's orders. On June 4th, Major George Hewitt, the commander of the